Hello, everyone. I am Pui Hamami, healthcare analyst at Edison, and we are delighted to have James Graham, the CEO of Recce Pharmaceuticals, with us today for our latest Edison TV presentation. Today, we will go over some of the latest developments at Recce Pharmaceuticals in its quest to develop innovative anti-infective therapies for challenging medical conditions and areas of unmet need. Now, James, Please frame the landscape in terms of the widespread and growing problem of antimicrobial drug resistance, and as a follow-up, how Recce's new class of synthetic anti-infectives and lead candidate Recce 327 in particular can potentially help address this global challenge. Hi, uh, good to be with you. Yes, look, the antibiotic pipeline has never been drier. The need has never been greater. Only last week, uh, World Health Organization released their global antibiotic uh, pipeline review of both preclinical and clinical assets. Pleasingly, Recce is actually clinically the most advanced new class of antibiotic in that pipeline, uh, and the only antibiotic that, uh, or anti-infective as we really term it, uh, that works against ATP synthesis as its primary mechanism of action, with of course many mechanisms of action beneath that. So when we look to the challenge, of course, of antimicrobial resistance or deadly superbugs around us, really the competitive landscape is 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 dry. There's just no, nothing out there. Um, so it creates a wonderful opportunity uh, from a competitive position. Um, whilst, of course, we would love a little bit of a peer comparison when there's not much else to compare to, it can be difficult to find evaluation. Nevertheless, it is an excellent position for our compound to be in, and we're advancing ahead accordingly. Oh, excellent. Well, that's great to hear. I mean, um, so I think you mentioned the um, the ATP mechanism of action. And um, so has the drug candidate yet been shown to be effective against some of the most virulent drug-resistant bacterial strains, such as, such as the escape pathogens? Most certainly. Uh, I should have noted we actually clinically are the most advanced escape pathogen company uh, in the world at this time. Escape pathogens are responsible for around 80% of all deadly bacterial infections. Uh, we've demonstrated an ability to not only work against all of those, but to continue to work with repeated use, which is one of the fundamental challenges of antibiotics to date. Uh, the, the ability, of course, of the bacteria to mutate and the antibiotics no longer keep up. But in our case, we work and keep on working with repeated use. So yes, the highly virulent versions, versions Yes, the um, hypermutated versions, and of course the standard versions as well. And we've combated those both in a preclinical setting where you do your repeat susceptibility studies against those, but in almost all cases there, we've also experienced um, those in a clinical setting uh, as well as of course clinical isolates, but uh, very, very active against those bacterial species. Okay, that's good to hear. Now, the lead indication for Recce and the intravenous formulation of R327 is uh, for sepsis and complex urinary, tr complex urinary tract infections and urosepsis. So maybe explain to us what's the current medical need for sepsis and urosepsis in particular, and how can R327 have the potential to make a real difference and improve outcomes in these uh, indications? Yes, to my knowledge, the FDA has awarded the only um, designation under the QIDP uh, designation for bacteriemia. And bacteriemia is the technical word for broad spectrum sepsis. Uh, and that award is to Recce 327 as a compound. That provides it uh, expedited regulatory review, which we've, we've um, taken advantage of to date, plus 10 years of market exclusivity above and beyond our patent positions, which are granted to 2041. So what that means, of course, is when we look to the space of sepsis, we really think as, as the space of urosepsis. That is because 30% of septic infections are from the underlying urinary tract infection. And it really begins um, from a place of following the science. When we started with our phase one study, we, of course, were IV administering to healthy volunteers and we noticed, obviously, a very nice dose correlation of the um, plasma concentrations rising. But we actually noticed an incredibly high concentration of our compound appearing in the human bladder. Now, a compound that has gone from the blood through the kidneys into the urinary tract system, and we've since defined that compound to be active when it's excreted, is a compound that bodes itself to, to an ideal uroseptic um, drug candidate. 
And really, that's what the results have shown to date. So effectively, there's been some strong uh, dose concentration in, in the urine with uh, when R327 has been administered. So, and with, I believe, very uh, good safety data to date, um, what are the next steps for intravenous R327's clinical development? Yeah, so we've uh, recently uh, dosed another, so we did 100, approximately 80 persons in the phase one. Uh, the phase 1B to A, we dosed around 25 persons. And the difference between those is really going for a fast infusion. So instead of a one-hour setting, which is your hospital setting, we've uh, because our compound works faster than any other antibiotic known to date, we went, well, let's administer it quickly. Let's administer it at first patient presentation, and let's stop that infection in its tracks. And what we did in that 25 patient cohort is, of course, demonstrate an ability to do that. But we take the the um, your, uh, the compound once it once it's passed through the body into the human urine, and we quickly expose it to bacteria. And what we're demonstrating in doing that is, if the compound has an efficacious ability when it's been consumed by the human body to still uh, overcome the deadly bacterial species. We achieved that. And what that means is an, as, as a very high probability of an efficacious capability across the human setting, um, meaning across the phase 2B, phase 3, that we would rapidly step into now, um, that that, that uh, type of study is a real layup to success for that. So what that means is I'd expect that phase you know, 2B, possibly phase 3 even, um, for urinary tract infections or uroseptic infections, because we'll capture those patients in the upper infected um, base where you can identify it in their blood uh, coming online later this year. Oh, okay. So we're going to see the, the drug in actual patients with those infections. So that will be a yeah. very uh, strong data point for investors and, re and uh, observers to consider. Um, now, in addition to the intravenous formulation, REC is also advancing a topical formulation of R327 for acute bacterial skin and skin structure infections including diabetic foot infections, which is, has been seen in some examples through Australia's Therapeutic Good Administration's um, special access scheme. Um, maybe just give us some uh, data on what sort of human efficacy data has been shown to date in the topical formulation. Yeah, the topical formulation is just an extraordinarily potent um, formulation of that same IV drug. Uh, that formulation is in a gel uh, um, formulation, and we basically have demonstrated in a DFI study, so diabetic foot infection study, uh, that that gel uh, treats the infection of the diabetic ulcer. We then took that across to the special access scheme use um, under the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, across a large variety of different patients, patients with complicated skin structure infections, diabetic foot ulcer infections, post-operative wound infections, prosthesis infections, and in all cases, all patients were, had a complete clinical response, which is scientific or medical language for were completely cured of their bacterial infections, and many were multi-drug resistant infections. So with the capability, of course, in a clinical setting, a formal clinical setting across to a medical setting, we took that data across to um, broaden our application to ABSSSI um, or acute bacterial skin structure infections. And what that really means is anything topically, if it's a bacterial infection, it's most likely applicable to that category. And that category is the category that we have an open clinical study on across multiple hospitals here in Australia, um, positioning for an IND submission uh, upon that data later this year. Okay. And, uh, you know, I believe relating to this diabetic foot, inf diabetic foot infection opportunity and the data that you've shown thus far, it's interesting to note that uh, earlier this year, Reki assigned a memorandum of understanding with PT Atena Biotechnologies Indonesia for an R&D collaboration. And this is with the support of the Indonesian government. So, I mean, as it relates to this, please let, um, elaborate on how the collaboration is leading to the strategy to start an actual phase three study in Indonesia for DFIs which I believe should be starting in the coming months. And, and effectively, this could potentially lead to an early revenue generation opportunity for the company. Yeah, look, revenue is a new word in our um, uh, language here. It, it, we've been so focused upon R&D programs, but to position for a commercial outcome. The commercial outcome in this case is, a, is driven by a registrational phase three study 
we looked at Indonesia, of course, just above Australia, so geographic proximity. But Indonesia is fascinating in, in that they have 11% diabetes rate. So you've got 280 million people, 11% have diabetes. Of those who have diabetes, about 45% of them get a diabetic foot infection. And of those diabetic foot infections, about 60% of them get infected. So I should say diabetic foot ulcers and 60% get infected. You get what I mean. <laughs> and what that really means is we have a major patient population. So in uh, Indonesia, the Indonesian government and the Australian government, with the support of Atana uh, and ourselves, of course, have come together for a major bilateral um, clinical study, uh, which, if successful, would see our company as the first Australian drug approved in Indonesia. Now, the first question is, well, does Indonesia have any money? How can they afford it? Um, just being a little crass there, but that's what people often think. Um, you've got 280 million people. Of course, that 11% that diabetes and the breakdown of those who get um, infected. About 9% of Indonesian Indonesia is actually in the high net worth category. So from a perspective of targeting private foot clinics, which there's many, many of them, in fact, near well over 100, in fact, uh, in Indonesia, of that high net worth category, sees an incredibly economic opportunity in the very near term for revenue, potentially very profitable revenue uh, to come from that region. And that's running in parallel to our US programs and um, continued focus across other therapeutic areas in the background. You know, when the government comes to you asking for the access to the world's most advanced new class of antibiotic, it's pretty hard to ignore that. Well, well absolutely. And I guess relating to that, um, so I believe you mentioned an IND uh, coming up later this year. Uh, how does that relate um, to your company's ex plans to expand R327 clinical development into U.S.-based clinical trial sites? We, we, we are focused on the USA. I mean, a number of our colleagues are US-based. Dr. John Prendergast, our chairman uh, there in Princeton, uh, Dr. Alan Dunton, who was former global head of uh, head of Janssen Research or Johnson & Johnson Research, he's over there in Boston and he's our chief medical advisor. So we are very US-focused. Um, we've looked to the global antibiotic pipeline or global antibiotic landscape You've got about 46, 48% as the US, Australia is 3%. But Australia's R&D rebate supports the development, of course, here in Australia. The phase one, phase two studies, safety and efficacy uh, are very well positioned and recognised in the United States. So we do those studies here, package them up to do, a, to do essentially phase threes in the United States under the nose of the FDA capital markets and patent offices, et cetera. So... Uh, we do maintain a focus towards an IND. We would expect later this year an IND for both IV and topical, and we are well positioned to, to deliver that. Okay. And so then we can expect US studies to start uh, shortly after that. And um... That's right. I'd really see next year as a US um, studies year uh, off the back of successful INDs. Excellent. Excellent. Now, of course, all of these clinical studies are, are qu quite costly endeavors, and uh, the company uh, was very successful. It announced in uh, July a $10 million of equity financing to support R327 advancement in the most uh, promising indications, as we've discussed. Um, what is the company's current cash runway following this financing, and what are some of the strategies that you're looking at towards uh, continuing to support the advancement of R327 in, uh, in its future progress? Yes, look, we announced actually only last week that a pro forma cash position of around $16.5 million as at the end of our financial year, 30th of June. Um, we really um, have a monthly expenditure of about $1.5 million, uh, but we get 43.5 cents R&D rebate. In fact, I can say for, for certain, we have the largest um, R&D advanced finding status with the Australian government. And what that means is two brilliant things. One is it, our R&D, 43.5 cents of every dollar we spend, is extended anywhere around the world. So those studies in the United States, the Australian taxpayer foots 43.5 cents of that. But we also have our R&D guaranteed. So over three years, fifty-five up to $55 million dollars of our R&D guarantee means that when we submit for an R&D claim, aka caveat free cash back from the government, we receive that. And what we've done with that is we then go to third parties who are prepared to lend against those R&D credits. In our case, that's both accrued, meaning expended R&D credits, 
uh, or R&D credits we've accumulated through expenditure, but also forward facing because we've got that government guarantee. So we've historically, um, we had about $11.2 million uh, in addition to that $10 million of equity, um, in addition to our cash balance uh, uh, come through. And I would expect to see over the very near months uh, a replenishment of that. So our cash is really um, taking us into FY of 26, uh, which is approximately 1st of July, 2025. So some 12 months from to date, driving the, um, the uh, catalysts of those clinical studies. Excellent. And so in closing, what are some of the key milestones and catalysts for Recce that we should expect to hear from over the next 12 to 24 months? The efficacy, efficacy, efficacy. This is the year of efficacy, if I, if I say it again. Um, what it really represents is we've demonstrated it, an efficacious ability against diabetic foot infections. We've broadened that study to ABSSSI infections in Australia, a, a phase two efficacy study there. We have coming online a registrational phase three diabetic foot ulcer infection study across Indonesia. We've demonstrated in IV dosing through a fast method of administration efficacy against bacteria when, when the compound is passed through the human body. Uh, and we will be rolling that into, of course, a phase two, maybe phase three Euroseptic study. Um, and then, of course, we've got our uh, special access scheme uh, patient case studies uh, taking place constantly in the background. So every way we look, having demonstrated our compound is safe, it is well tolerated, we're now showing that it works. And that's a really exciting time in our company's journey. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us, James. And we really look forward to exciting updates on the company's progress over the coming months. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Thank <laughs> you.